Hi, my name is Pat Helland, and I'm here to talk to you about autonomous computing, and in particular, the second part of the story, which is how autonomy can empower scale. Now, this digs into the patterns we use to compute across autonomous or independent boundaries, and how looking at those patterns tells us, wow, we could do this in a way where we have a scalable solution. The programmer doesn't have to care about scale, but it can scale. Now, that's if we pay attention. These are my own ideas and opinions. They are not necessarily reflective of the position of my employers, past or present. So let's look at the agenda for today. First, we're going to introduce the idea of autonomy and what is autonomous computing. Then we're going to talk about three big pieces in the pattern. Fiefdoms, which are an autonomous boundary, where computing happens only by messaging coming in and out because it's independent or autonomous. Collaborations, which are sets of related messages to do long-running work. Emissaries, which sit outside the autonomous boundary, but help you fill out those messages that are in the collaboration. That takes us to the types of data in an autonomous world. There's private data contained inside of that fiefdom, inside the autonomous boundary. There are collaborations, which again are the related messages that flow in and out to do some long-running business operation. There's reference data, that's data that comes from this autonomous fiefdom, and it is used on the outside by the emissary to help you fill out the messages so they're useful and understood within the fiefdom. Finally, there's user data, such as shopping cart, which would run within an emissary outside the autonomous boundary, but is then going to be used to help fill out those collaboration messages. Next, we go to working across fiefdoms. How do we do work when we're in an independent autonomous world and we're trying to negotiate with messages? Next, we move into working within a fiefdom. Here, you're going to see how do we break the pieces of work up to actually handle long-running work and also to manage the resources that this autonomous boundary wants to take care of. That takes us to the heart of this particular presentation, scale agnostic computing. How can you actually have a pattern and use the pattern so the programmers for your system don't care about scale, but the system can scale? And then we conclude by reinforcing how autonomous computing can empower scale. Let's introduce autonomous computing. Autonomy is long distance, long running, and personal. Autonomy means I'm working with messages because shared transactions create dependence and risk. And so that is not autonomous. That's dependent, not independent. Long distance because messages happen across these boundaries. And that's the whole point of the discussion is what does it mean to work across independent and autonomous boundaries? And an example here is company A to company B. So it is in fact long distance work. Long running, it takes time to deliver a message. First of all, you do work to generate the message and commit that in your system, then it goes across and then it gets processed on the other system. So when you're doing this work, multiple messages are usually required. And these are related messages for each collaborative task. It's also personal. Each company may have many, many partners, but it's important to provide a facade that each partner is isolated from the other. If I go to a hotel, I don't really want to know about the other guests in general, and the hotel doesn't want to tell me about them. Autonomy is personal, shared, and scalable. Again, personal because related messages provide a sense of privacy to the partner. The pieces of work are dedicated to a specific partner. It's shared, though, because the business has resources, and those resources are being allocated and shared across many partners. And so you have pieces of work that are dedicated to managing those resources, and then how do you share them? It's connected, though, because pieces of work are connected with messages. Internally, you use pieces to connect those messages. And so you end up in this composition where messaging can con connect pieces, and so the work can be comprised of many small pieces. There is a duality of autonomous work. It's both personal to each partner, but the resources are shared. And that's the first autonomous computing talk. It's also scalable because scalable autonomous work, you have many connected pieces of work and the pieces can be moved around for scale. And that's the second autonomous computing talk. 
Now, these are combined in one version of the presentation that takes a little longer because the, the repeated material is not there. But again, there's two basic discussions here, the duality of autonomous work and how that can in fact be scalable. So let's talk about the three basic ideas in autonomous computing, fiefdoms, collaborations, and emissaries. So what are the pieces of the pattern? A fiefdom is autonomous compu computation and data, and it's autonomous or independent of outsiders. It doesn't do transactions across those boundaries. A collaboration is a set of related messages for one business task. So you're connecting these related messages because they're part of doing one piece of work, even though there's multiple messages associated with them. So this collaboration correlates the messages with a unique identifier. Now, emissaries help work with one or more fiefdoms, and they run outside the autonomous boundary. Usually they fill out the messages correctly, and that makes it easier for the fiefdom. This is centuries of business practices have followed this pattern. I'm not talking just about how computers do it. I'm talking about how our grandparents did it when all they had was paper to go across these boundaries. And this is just mirroring what they did. And this helps us explain long-running work, scalable systems, offline work, and more. So what do you do? Well, you have collaborations for long-running work. What is a collaboration? It's a notion that I'm defining here as a part of this model which is a set of related messages. Now this is a pattern that's been used for centuries. Subsequent messages in the business operation would flow between business to business. In the past, it was with paper. And it does one long running business operation. Now, when I was a kid, I remember these a lot, the multi-part, multi-page paper forms. And so there would be multiple pieces of paper that were attached to each other and different parts to fill out. And there was a serial number stamped in the upper corner and you would walk in and typically one per party would fill out the part one and hand it over and the back page would be handed back to you. And then the rest of the form would move on with more being written. Now that moved from department to department to accomplish the long running work. So you did long running work via multi-part forms and as pages, as forms were, parts were filled out of the form, the back page would be taken off and kept inside of the department that was dealing with the work. Now these always had a unique serial number. That unique serial number correlated the pages and the work completion so that you could tie them back together as more and more work for the long running operation would occur. Eventually, those completed forms were filed away and then they were retired and archived and there was a life cycle for the, the work, there was a life cycle for the paper forms, and it usually resulted in the paper forms eventually going to the shredder after many years. So let's talk more about multi-part paper forms. With a multi-part paper form, you had many writers on one form. Now, albeit one at a time, because they all wrote on the top page and then the back got taken off. So paper forms had many parts, many collaborators, but one writer at a time. So imagine you have a front desk for, you know, for example, a car repair shop or something like that. A customer walks into the front desk. So the person behind the desk pulls out the paper form with many pages and many parts. Customer fills out the customer info in part one. The front desk fills out part two, describing the work that the company is going to do for them. The back page is torn off and handed to the customer so they could bring it back when the work is completed and they're going to make everything come about and get their car back or whatever it is. And then the next page is put in the file cabinet at the front desk. The other pages are put in the outbox. That outbox then takes it to the back office to do some more and it comes out of their inbox to the back office where they do some work and they fill out part three to describe the progress that's been made. The back page goes in their file cabinet, the rest goes into their outbox, and then the mailroom picks that up and moves it to the inbox of the, oh, say the executive suite, which is gonna issue approval. And then the executive suite looks at the information with the customer info, front desk, back office, puts the approval, and puts in the last copy again in their file cabinet, and then pushes this to the outbox. And that would typically go back to the front desk and the customer would come back in and things would get worked through to completion. Now, 
The world's different with computers. It's a little bit kind of nicer. Paper forms had one collaborator at a time because you had to have the piece of paper to actually write on the front page. And you appended information on the form's front page and then that paper form moved on. Computer collaborations can be a little more flexible. You can do concurrent appending to the co each collaborator's reserved space. So again, each collaborator has their place to write, not where the other collaborators write. They have their dedicated place to write. But as they independently add things, those messages can flow to other co collaborators. And the per collaborator messages are seen in the order that they're written by each respective collaborator. What's important is these messages are related to each other and they're seen by all the collaborators, sometimes with a slight delay, but they're all seen together. So imagine I have three collaborators, A, and notice the collaboration has a column which has got the stuff A wrote and another column with the stuff B wrote and the stuff C wrote, but in this case, they're grayed out because they're not written yet. Similarly with B, it has the same collaboration with the same columns of information. And C also has that because there's three collaborators on this same collaboration in this digital collaboration. They're all connected by some form of network. Notice the identifier for this collaboration is the same number. It is replicas of the same collaboration. Now, collaborator B can add a message. This is his first message and it eventually gets to the other replicas of then the other collaborators can see it. Collaborator A can also write its first message and it works through the network and gets to the other collaborators. And then collaborator C can do the same. Things move through. These are replicas of the same collaboration, but what's written is dedicated to who wrote it. So there's no confusion, confusion about pulling the replicas together. And indeed, you can have different things written at the same time by different collaborators and their work their way through. So this is what I call a digital collaboration. Now this is a pattern based on autonomy. Autonomy means boundaries and independence. Boundaries and independence mean no shared transactions. There is no way I'm going to lock up my database waiting for what you decide if you're an outsider. So I'm not gonna take record locks, I'm not gonna do transactions with you, but I will do messages and try to get work done to do business. No shared transactions mean a sequence of related messages but that sequence of related messages, they need to be tied together. And I think we need a more formal notion of collaboration that makes it easy for the partners in each side of this to tie together those related messages. And again, the collaboration sometimes is annoying to fill it out and it can be complicated. So having software that runs outside of the autonomous boundary to help you with the messages, the sequence of messages, that's a useful pattern we see in, you know, person human life and also in computing life. Let's talk about the types of data we see in an autonomous world. Well, there's private data that's kept inside of that autonomous boundary of a fiefdom. Their collaborations, which are actually data, the messages and the sequence of messages that flow in and out of the boundary. There's reference data, which is information published from within the fiefdom that then can be used to help with the collaborations. And finally, there is user data kept in private to the emissary running on the outside, but incredibly useful to implement the collaboration. Now, I differentiate between data on the outside versus data on the inside. And in 2005, I wrote a paper for the database conference CIDR, Conference on Innovative Database Research, and it talked about those differences. Now inside data, that's pretty classic relational data. It's protected by a database in an application. And if it's relational, it uses values and it relates the values and that's the relational model. There's no formal notion in the database of objects and identity. Furthermore, the shape and the form of the data is prescribed. You can change it as time goes on as you talk about what's in one table in rows and columns. Now, outside data is not quite the same. It ends up being objects with identity and maybe versions for those identities. Now, outside autonomous boundaries is where this stuff lives. It's outside the database, it's outside the application surrounding the database, and it's a thing that's pushed out into the mean cruel world to be shared across boundaries. It's typically not protected by an application. 
And furthermore, when you wrote it, you wrote it. So what's in it meant what you meant when you wrote it. And so there's a notion of descriptive metadata. What was meant when it was created? Sometimes that metadata is contained inside the actual object that's outside, like in JSON or XML where the, you describe it inside. Sometimes it points to some description in some other fixed versioned metadata. Outside data is immutable. Once you say it, it can't be unsaid, just like the president on TV. When you say it, people know it forever. Now, data flowing outside of a fiefdom is outside data. It is typically semi-structured, not relational. That's very common. It's objects with identity and maybe versions. It has descriptive metadata. The, the description of the shape and the form of the data happens at the time the data is written. And it may be self-describing, may point to another description, but it is describing, not prescribing the shape. And it is understood by the fiefdom and probably understood by outsiders because that's important if it's flowing back and forth between inside and outside. Now let's rethink data across autonomous boundaries. First of all, there is private data inside of the fiefdom and it can be updated transactionally and it's contained within that boundary. There's also reference data. <clears throat> now that's used to fill out a collaboration and it's typically sent from that fiefdom to the outside world. So let's do some examples here. A product catalog or a price list, the current mortgage rates for that mortgage broker, the shipping weights and the costs to ship a box from a shipping company. Those are all examples of information published, updated sometimes, but it talks about what it means to work with the autonomous company across this autonomous boundary. Next, there's single user data. Now that's owned by the emissary and owned to try to make the multi-message collaboration work successfully. Now, some examples might be a shopping cart. This is the stuff I wanna buy, and so I'm putting it together and gonna to send it in on the collaboration. The user preferences, the session state, there are many examples of information kept outside the trust boundary that are used to help make it easier in interacting with the trust boundary. And then finally, the collaboration data. That's the messages sent within a collaboration. And again, a collaboration is a sequence of messages that flows across these boundaries. Now, the information in a collaboration may be derived from the reference data. So the product catalog information, the price list information, that would go into an order. It may be derived from other sources. So in that collaboration data, this again, the sequence of messages to do work, you might have a customer ID, you might have a description of the items you wanna buy, you might talk about the hotel location, room type and dates. All of this information is gonna flow across the boundary. Now let's talk a little bit about reference data. Reference data is really useful to fill out a collaboration to get work done. It might have part numbers and prices and delivery dates and shipping weights, all sorts of information that is useful to make it work. So let's take an example of a big online retailer. And it's got a back end, and the back end I view as a fiefdom. And it's publishing its product catalog and price list. And so that's information that talks about what can you buy, how does it work, what are the costs, what is the shipping date, when can it come? Now that shopping has got reference data and single user data. It's a combination of that published reference data and the information that you're accumulating on the outside as you're getting ready to talk to the retailer. So the shopping cart's an example. So the single user data is accumulated by extracting stuff from the product catalog and price list and adding other things like the user's credit card and so forth. And once you've accumulated all of that, you might do a checkout where the shopping cart is then converted into a collaboration message. So you fill out the collaboration with information from the shopping cart and you send it into the online retailer to make things get ordered. I think of this notion I call recurrent reference data. And so that's stuff that's published periodically. And so one example is when I was a kid, there was this thing called the Sears catalog. It was a very large 
book that came twice a year. It was a very common pattern. And it was a highlight of the year when we were children in the, in the 1960s. It would come home to our home and we would sit around the kitchen table and mom would go through trying to decide and we would all try to convince her to buy some toys that were in it because this catalog, you could buy kitchen items, you could buy toys, you could buy clothing, you could buy tools for the garage. It was an amazing thing that you could do. And so we would all try to convince mom to buy from this Sears catalog. And so it's very common to see these things come out periodically. Nowadays, it's not every six months. Nowadays, it's updated every day or sometimes even more often. Nowadays, that reference data on an online environment is pushed out to caches that you read and look at when you're shopping on the computer. And it might be stored on literally tens of thousands of computers with all the products and all the multiple replicas of it to give information about those products and their prices and the other stuff. Now, a collaboration may cite the reference data's version. When we would fill out that catalog that came twice a year, there was a, literally a form in the catalog that we would tear out and would say, this is a form for the fall winter catalog for Sears for this year. And so the form said how to interpret the reference data. Sometimes the fiefdom will take a particular price or something for a product and go and look and say, is that an acceptable price for right now? And the reason I say acceptable price is because prices go up and down and you don't want to reject an order immediately. You typically want to, you know, honor things for hours or days after the price changes. So the fiefdoms may accept stale reference data because this is not an atomic right now thing. It's got time and, and a lag of time that needs to be tolerated in order to make the business work. So the fiefdom either checks the versions or checks the fields and it only accepts collaboration data that it wants to, that it thinks is within the bounds it wants to do business using. Online services, again, cache that reference data in server pools. And so you can see some really funny things. The replicas of a price are not updated constantly. They may be jittery. And as you're rolling out across replicas of the cache in an online system, there's a window of time when you might see the earlier price, the later price, the earlier price, and it settles down and it works its way through. And so consequently, the collaboration and the fiefdom will tolerate that variation as things are changing in the reference data. Let's talk for a minute about embedding foreign emissaries. Imagine I have two big autonomous boundaries. In this example, fiefdom A is a shipping company. They, you call them, they put boxes on trucks, they get them where you want. Fiefdom B is a distribution company. It has inventory in warehouses and place an order and it puts it in the boxes. Now, Fiefdom B uses Fiefdom A's business a lot. They're kind of very tightly related uh, business relationship. However, they're autonomous and they're independent. So you might end up having a piece of code that runs inside the distribution company B that helps make it easy to work with the shipping company A. And all of the information from the shipping company, the destinations, the schedules for trucks, the rates for boxes based upon weight and size, the capacity of what can be done on each day in each truck. That information is shipped out from the shipping company off to be used by the piece of code that's inside the distribution company. And so I talk about an emissary for A running inside the belly of the fiefdom B. Now, that's kind of nice for the distribution company because now they can have a really rich piece of code that helps them figure out what boxes are going to cost what, how to put them on what shipment, when things can get there. And it can be calculated largely locally before doing the actual details of placing the order. Yeah, sometimes a truck's full, there's things like that, but mostly it works. And so you'll see many different shipments working as this distribution company does a lot of business with the shipping company. And this is a pattern that's very important. And I call that embedding a foreign emissary to make life work across these autonomous boundaries. So again, let's rethink data across autonomous boundaries and recap this. What are the types of data in autonomous computing? Private data inside the belly of the fiefdom. It's, you don't share it directly with outsiders, only indirectly. Single user data runs outside of the autonomous boundary, but it helps you do the work with that fiefdom, helps you get those multiple messages across to do the business over time. Now, reference data is really useful because it talks about what the fiefdom can do, what things are, and it allows you to fill out those collaborations. And then 
Finally, the collaboration data, that's the sequence of messages that flow across that boundary. So we see these four kinds of data. And you might have another emissary doing other work with different collaborations with the fiefdom. And you can also see offline emissaries. They queue their work. They queue the reference data that would come from the fiefdom is queued up and stored offline. And then they queue the collaboration messages that go back and forth. And indeed, from my perspective as a transaction person, because there's no shared transaction across the boundaries, pretty much all of these interactions are a form of offline because they do happen one step at a time with different messages and different transactions. So what's the data for autonomous work? There's private data used inside the autonomous fiefdom boundary. There's collaborations, which is the sequence of messages and the individual messages that describe the long running work across boundaries. There's reference data. It, it has options that you can use within the collaboration that you're doing work with. And finally, there's user data, which runs outside, but it is the local goals of the outsider as it prepares the sequence of messages in the collaboration to get work done. Let's talk about working across fiefdoms. Here we have fiefdom A and fiefdom B. How do they get work done? So you do work without shared transactions. To me, when you say autonomy, you say independence, that means you don't share transactions because I'm not gonna lock things up waiting for you. Autonomy means no distributed transactions. You can do local transactions, but not distributed ones. So work happens with messaging. You send and receive messages and they're related to each other to do one long running piece of work. And that's what I call a collaboration. Now let's dig deeper and let's talk about online shopping with collaborations. So I have an emissary that's gonna help me do shopping. Now in my model, when I go to a big e-commerce retailer and I'm looking at the products and putting them in the shopping cart and so forth, that online web experience or the experience on the app on my phone, that is an emissary. It's outside the trust boundary. Only when submit happens, do things get prepared and go inside the trust boundary of the back end. So that emissary may have reference data, may have a shopping cart. It will push submit and create the collaboration. Now over there is the back end. The back end knows what's in the warehouses, what's going on trucks, how much money do we have, how much have we charged, it does credit check, it does all of the finances, all of the important parts it takes to actually do business as a part of that retailer. So in comes a message which says, let's buy this stuff. Pat wants to buy this stuff. And that means I wanna reserve the inventory, I wanna schedule a shipment, I wanna check the credit card. And so all of that work happens in response to the new incoming collaboration. Now my email's kind of minding its own business here. And an email gets sent back to me when it usually comes within a few seconds and it says, bleep, your order is processed, delivery on Tuesday. I wanna point out sometimes that message and that email can take 30 minutes or something if the backend system is slow and it's asynchronous queued processing. And that's a healthy natural pattern to allow queuing on that backend system. On Monday, the stuff is gonna ship and I'm gonna get my credit card charged, that's cool. So I get another email which is stuff shipped, deliveries expected on Tuesday, pretty cool. All, that's wonderful. Now that backend processing guy's, you know, interacting with the shipper, doing his own things with the shipping company on the other side, but it finds out that the stuff arrived at my doorstep on Tuesday. So I get yet another email confirming the delivery and that bleeps my email. Now that collaboration number 75392 remains active. It'll remain active typically for 90 days to verify there's no problem because I might call up and say, hey, I need to return this or something like that. So that ongoing sequence of messages may live for a while, but typically it will retire after an expiration pin window, which may be 30 or 90 days, depending upon the business rules for the fiefdom. Let's talk for a minute about embedding foreign emissaries. Imagine I have two big autonomous boundaries. In this example, Fiefdom A is a shipping company. They, you call them, they put boxes on trucks, they get them where you want. Fiefdom B is a distribution company. It has inventory in warehouses and place an order and it puts it in the boxes. Now Fiefdom B uses Fiefdom A's business a lot. They're kind of very tightly related business relationship. However, they're autonomous and they're independent. 
So you might end up having a piece of code that runs inside the distribution company B that helps make it easy to work with the shipping company A. And all of the information from the shipping company, the destinations, the schedules for trucks, the rates for boxes based upon weight and size, the capacity of what can be done on each day in each truck, that information is shipped out from the shipping company off to be used by the piece of code that's inside the distribution company. And so I talk about an emissary for A running inside the belly of the fiefdom B. Now, that's kind of nice for the distribution company because now they can have a really rich piece of code that helps them figure out what boxes are going to cost what, how to put them on what shipment, when things can get there. And it can be calculated largely locally before doing the actual details of placing the order. Yeah, sometimes a truck's full, there's things like that, but mostly it works. And so you'll see many different shipments working as this distribution company does a lot of business with the shipping company. And this is a pattern that's very important. And I call that embedding a foreign emissary to make life work across these autonomous boundaries. Now, back when we had paper forms, you could do complicated workflows with paper forms and you could manage subtasks with them also. And that would happen inside of a company or across companies. As I mentioned before, the online retailer might contact the distribution company and that's a subtask in to do my work to get my shipment to me. Or you might see if I go to a car repair shop that there's the car repair, but there's also the parts department that's dealing with it. So in this example, we're looking at Acme and Sons car repair. They're doing some work for Sally Smith in the town of Derriere. And then they use a new paper form to get the parts. So what you see here is you correlate these pieces of paper by putting the numbers, the sequence number for the form. And so those form IDs match it together. They correlate it together. So the car repair order, the parts order says, hey, what car repair order is this part for? And the parts order says the, the, car, the, the actual repair order, the repair order says the parts order, they're correlated with each other by looking at the sequence numbers that are present. You can do a complex workflow using paper forms. The subtasks can be managed with paper forms, lots of multiple steps, lots of related forms, and they're tied together with sequence numbers. So when the subtask completes, you can use the paper form to go to the other original major task, pull that form out and say the subtask is completed, tracking sub subtasks and a very complex tree of work. This can be long running. In computers, it can be seconds, minutes, or hours. You know, with paper forms, it was typically days, weeks, or months. And you would add entries to the multi-part paper forms with the subtasks informing bigger subtasks of progress. And you would append only to those paper forms and that advanced the workflow. And so an example may be that I wanna schedule my outgoing shipments to customers, but I gotta to wait to see when the incoming shipments are actually arriving. And then when they actually arrive, then I can use that to stimulate the actual delivery of the shipments to my customers once my suppliers get it to my warehouse. All of this can be driven by a complex relationship of paper forms. And that's how things were done before I was born and I'm kind of old, so that was a long time ago. Collaborations uncertainty and reconciliation. Fiefdoms live in their own world. They are not tied to a transaction. But if I'm doing multiple things of ongoing work and I'm doing them across complex things, my suppliers of my parts, the customers buying my parts, I have a lot of uncertainty. Will this business operation complete? Will my suppliers deliver? Will my customers cancel? Everything I do in the beginning of a collaboration, it typically increases my uncertainty because I don't know if it's really going to happen. I don't know if I can make it all work. Now, reconciled work decreases uncertainty. When the airplane takes off, I actually know which passengers were seated on it. And so that closes off that uncertain business where I'm not quite sure which passengers will actually make it. I'm not sure how my overbooking is going to be. There's a lot of things to worry about. So if I'm managing inventory for the widgets for parts, there's a minimum that I may have in the warehouse and there's a maximum I may have. And there's a probability distribution, which is 
you know, copes with the uncertainty of my suppliers delivering, my customers canceling, and I'm constantly living in a world of increasing and decreasing uncertainty. Collaborations mean uncertainty. Things increase uncertainty, and then later they resolve and decrease uncertainty. Can I sell more widgets? Will I have enough? Will the, will, who will cancel? Will I get the deliveries? What's the risk versus the reward to making commitments with? That leads to notions of overbooking, overprovisioning, and apologies. Businesses have uncertainty. What I want to have is I want to have happy customers, so I could choose to not promise anything to a customer unless it's actually in my warehouse right now and I'm certain I can ship it from my warehouse. But that means I have a lot of inventory sitting there costing me money. So I might want to optimize that. I might want to promise to sell stuff even when I don't have it because I know some percentage will cancel. So I may want to overbook to limit my idle inventory. And I typically want to manage that middle ground between overbooking and overprovisioning to balance the business risk. Now, if I have pools of stuff that are equivalent, fungible stuff, that reduces my uncertainty. That is why hotels have a category of rooms, king-sized non-smoking rooms. There may be 20 of them at the hotel. And so I can cope with uncertainty because they're equivalent. They're fungible. So I want to balance the cost and the benefit by considering, do I want lost business? Well, I'm going to over-provisioning will cause me to needlessly reject orders and I've lost business. Do I want to deal with angry customers? Well, overbooking may mean I need to apologize, and that's a drag too. So I wrote more about this in a 2009 paper called Building on Quicksand that was again at the CIDR conference. So what are the implications of autonomy across boundaries? Autonomy, well, that's independence. That means no shared transactions. No shared transactions means the only choice I have is sequences of messages and long running work. Long running work works across time and I have to accept uncertainty. And accepting uncertainty means part of the problem is managing business risk. If I'm autonomous, I have to deal with uncertainty and risk and manage that risk. So let's talk about how you build this. How do you do work within a fiefdom? Well, inside of a fiefdom, I think of there being activities and activity data. So you have lots of ongoing collaborations. They may be alive for seconds to months, and they're driven by incoming messages or timers saying a certain amount of time has gone by. So here I have fiefdom A, which is a shipping company A, and it has two different collaborations working with different partners. And it's got shipment ABC and shipment DEF. Now an activity and the activity data each manage a single collaboration. So I have an activity for the first collaboration and a separate activity for the second um, collaboration. Each of these activities is a state machine talking about the sequence of messages that are happening on the collaboration. What's allowed to happen next? What do I do? And it manages that sequence, both incoming and outgoing messages. Now, activities are fiefdom private and activity data is private data. So you see the information about the state machine, the messages received so far and planning to send or we have sent, all of that is wrapped up in private data inside the belly of the fiefdom itself. Now it's okay to have internal collaborations because you have to coordinate inside the fiefdom. So we'll talk more about how collaborations can be inside of the trust boundary, the autonomous boundary, and how they work inside as well as coming in and out. But activities have a bounded lifetime. The collaboration lives for a bounded window of time and then it retires and gets cleaned up and archived. And you can partition those things by their activity sequence number. They're private to the fiefdom. And I just don't care if they're implemented in SQL or NoSQL. Both have strengths and weaknesses, but that's not the topic here. The topic is about the pattern, not that aspect of the implementation. Now let's talk about resources and resource data. A resource lives across multiple collaborations and activities, and it typically represents a tangible good, inventory in, of a particular part in the warehouse. 
the re reservations for a hotel room for a particular hotel on a particular night in a particular class. What's on this specific truck that's shipping next Saturday? You want to manage these by type, date, and location. So you end up with a lot of individual resources to be tracked by this autonomous fiefdom. So you may have multiple activities and multiple resources. The activity deals with the actual single customer shipment. The customer may want to ship many boxes on many trucks. Now that, of course, has to interact with the manifest on the trucks. When are their schedules? What's going on in the truck? And how does it work? It interacts with warehouses. It interacts with the billing. Separately, you have to have some data, which is, again, the resource, which tracks a single truck's manifest, one warehouse's daily contents, one customer's monthly charges. And so each of these the activities have to do with a long-running piece of work, and the resources have to do with the shared things across those activities. You end up with lots of small resources and their activities. So do I have unique or pooled resources? Sometimes resources are unique, but much more often they're pooled. They're fungible, a thing. Uh, I find it fascinating that you can group things together and deal with them as an, you know, a single pool. There is a notion of a standard pig in the commodities future. It's called a pork belly. And you can buy and sell pigs that don't exist yet. You can have an aisle seat and not care which seat on the aisle is on the aisle. You can have a king-sized non-smoking room, and you don't get to know precisely which room, but you know it will be king-sized and non-smoking. Is that resource time-bounded? Most resources are. The airplane takes off on Saturday. When it takes off, it takes off. After that, the seats don't really matter other than as historic information. You have food that is being stocked on a shelf and it has expirations. Things are time bound for the most part. There are other things where you make them time bound by managing, managing them as inventory. You will periodically say, what's the contents of this particular part at this warehouse? I will count it and I will do a monthly count and a monthly tracking of the activity on that part in that warehouse. And then accounting has to resolve shortages and errors, but you have to wrap it up for accounting purposes with a time bound window. Resources are fine grained per stock keeping unit, per thing, per warehouse, per month. And so it resolves to lots of individual fine grained resources. And I want to point out accountants like to count. All of this information is important to manage the finances of a business. So there's this interplay of resources and activities. Resources are fine grained details, again, per stock keeping unit, per warehouse, per time window. And there's lots of them, lots of combinations, lots of different resources to manage. Activities you are doing per resource changes. Okay, I want to track the outgoing shipments. I want to track the planned incoming shipments. All of these things revolve around the resources. Who's buying it? Who's delivering it? All of that impacts the resource. And so you have long running, multi-step, per resource, and time bounded. Now let's talk about resources and their activities. So there's private data in the shipping company. In the fiefdom A, it's got a shipping company, it's got its data. It also has a single resource, a single thing describing that one truck trip this upcoming Saturday, this upcoming Sunday, it's going from San Francisco to LA, what's on the truck, how much space is left. Similarly, I have another truck, truck trip, four, five, six. That's a resource. What's going out on the truck from LA to New York at 3 p.m. on Monday? How much stuff is on the truck? How much space is left? That, those two things are resources, and those are private data that is kept inside of the shipping company. Also, there's resources for customer ABC. What did he buy this month? Customer DEF, what did they buy this month? So now, let's take an activity coming in. I have a collaboration arriving to do a shipment, shipment DEF for customer DEF. And so I want to create activity activity Y for this particular customer DEF, and it's going to coordinate a single shipment, the single shipment that I want to make for that customer on that date. That also is private data. Now, it needs to put some boxes on the truck from San Francisco to LA. This particular thing is I'm going to ship some boxes from San Francisco to New York, 
That means they have to be on two trucks, truck trip one, two, three on Sunday and truck trip four, five, six on Monday. Sunday takes it from San Francisco to LA. Monday launches, it leaves Monday to go LA to New York City. So in order to ship the box, the activity for that customer has to do work with the resource of the truck. Now to do that, I believe you set up a collaboration, which is a sequence of messages that flow between the work that we're doing for that one shipment and the work we're doing for that one truck trip. Similarly, you have to set up another collaboration, another sequence of messages that's going to do with that actual truck trip that's coming up on Monday. Finally, you have to set up a sequence of messages that deals with the billing for that customer. Separately, there's you know customer ABC wants to do shipment ABC X. And so that comes in from as a collaboration into the shipping company. It also wants to put some stuff on truck trip from LA to New York City on Monday. So it does messages and a collaboration to orchestrate getting another box on that truck. And then it wants to charge. Now, you have these issues. If the first truck from San Francisco to LA is late, it doesn't get there on time, then you need to orchestrate with the activity that is handling that single box to say you're not gonna make it on the second truck and you need to figure out another second truck to ship it on. All of these things weave between the long running work of the collaboration with the customer and the resources that you're using inside of your company. All of this is done as a relationship between resources and activities over stages, over messages, over minutes, seconds, days, months. So activities and resources are both kept in fiefdom private data. There's long running work via messaging and multiple transactions happen inside each fiefdom. And to coordinate inside, you typically use related messages just like collaborations. So activities are the caretakers for their collaboration. A collaboration has a replica on each side of its shared work. Remember, shared work. Remember the messages arrive after they're sent by the other partner. And so you have a replica on that side. And so when a collaboration is coming in and out and messages are coming in and out, you need to have a, that flows across lots of different collaborations to piece this stuff together. So you see multiple collaborations going on coming in and out and also inside the fiefdom. Now, each new collaboration starts an activity to manage its work. And again, the life cycle may be seconds, minutes, days, or months. So here you see activities to deal with the collaborations with the business partners on the outside. But you also see activities around the resource to manage the sequence of messages around that activity for that long running piece of work. Remember when the truck from on Sunday from San Francisco to LA was late, the boxes related to moving onto the next truck that on Monday from LA to New York, that has to coordinate about the box and you have to reschedule it on a different truck when the first truck is late. All of these things care, are caretakers for their collaborations. Inside of the truck's resource, you're also caring for the, collabor the activity, the collaboration dealing with the single boxes that are on it. So this is a pattern that recurs throughout this system. So what are the implications of autonomy on inside fiefdoms? Well, you have incoming multiple message collaborations. So you better have a state machine to handle the sequence of messages because otherwise you get confused. And the workflow that you're doing may need new outgoing collaborations. A minute ago, we talked about a customer wanting to ship a box from San Francisco to New York. Well, that had to deal with two trucks. So I needed workflow to deal with two trucks. So I have to have a state machine for one or more collaborations. I call that an activity. And again, it's got an incoming collaboration and it may generate more outgoing collaborations, but each activity is a state machine of the messages across its collaborations that it's managing. So having outgoing multi-message collaborations means I may need to fill them out so that the other side understands the things. I may need the reference data to deal with it. I may need to manage that. So I'm gonna have emissaries embedded in these activities to deal with the outgoing collaborations. Now, I have stuff that's managed by a fiefdom across collaborators. So I am uncertain how that's gonna work out. I'm gonna have a state machine 
that resolves the individual collaboration and the collaborator's work. And did it complete or did it cancel? What's happening? And so I have per collaborator, per resource state machine. So that is literally the truck that's going from LA to New York. Each box is going to have information about whether that box is going to make it on time when the truck leaves on Monday. So I have uncertainty about the inventory of stuff. I have uncertainty about how full my truck is going to be on Monday. And so I have to have per resource cross activity state of stuff. So the combination of the state machines for all of the things contributing to that resource and the information that crosses all of those things, these activities, that is what I call a resource. So let's talk about scale agnostic computing. How can a business programmer not care about scale? And yet the actual system itself can scale bigger and bigger and bigger as the workload gets bigger. What is scale agnostic computing? Well, I wrote a paper for the Conference on Innovative Database Research in 2007 called Life Beyond Distributed Transactions in Apostate's Opinion. And it introduced this notion. The idea is my application has two different parts to it. The upper part, the code doesn't know anything about scale. It's just written to do the business work, but it doesn't know about scale. It's constrained such that it cannot access any features in the system that can't scale without bound. To do that, we have to have an API. How do I get work done? What are the things I can do? So I call that a scale agnostic API, an API that allows the upper half to not care and not know about scale. Now, indeed, the lower half does care and know about scale. It is managing placement of resources. How many servers do I have? Do I need more servers? There's a lot of stuff the lower half does, but the vast majority of the application can run on top and not care about scale. It can be scale agnostic. So a scale agnostic API literally only supports scalable features. If you can't give that feature without scaling, then the, a, the application itself doesn't get to use it. And the paper introduced a notion of entities, the small amount of data with a unique ID. And by small, I mean it's, you know, kilobytes or small megabytes. It can fit on one server. It can run in one transactional environment. Now, you can have lots and lots and lots of entities. And you can send messages between entity A to entity B, and the system guarantees they get delivered and processed. But you're doing a transaction per entity. So this one little entity A is going to do a transaction. Now, it may decide I want to send a message to entity B, and it commits that, and then the plumbing moves it from A to B, but the transaction runs inside entity A, including scheduling outgoing messages or consuming incoming messages. Now, that scale agnostic upper layer has business logic, and it reasons about work by using messaging between the entities but it doesn't know how many entities and it doesn't care about scale. It just cares about the business logic it's doing. The scale aware lower layer provides scale for the upper layer without the upper layer knowing it. So what it does is it can dynamically move these entities. It can get more servers and move things around as long as it can deliver the messages and process the messages, routing those things to the new entity's home, then things work with scale agnostic computing. Now, how did things scale back in the day with paper? How did you do autonomous computing and scale with paper? Well, you had paper forms for collaborations. You had paper forms for activities. You had paper forms for resources. And so to do scale agnostic management of work with paper, you had to support the paper forms with the multi parts. You had to support the, the ability to have an inbox and an outbox, and you typically had a pretty big mail room that could take from one person's, one department's outbox and get it to the other department's inbox. And as things scaled, there were more departments and more inboxes and more things for the mail room to deliver. But it was all around paper forms going from here to there. So you could have scale agnostic activities. You would do lots of work for lots of customers and the more customers and the more activity work you did, the more people you had to hire, the more inboxes and outboxes you need, the, needed, the more file cabinets you needed, and the more paper forms you needed. But you could get more and more by hiring more people and more places to store the paper. Similarly, 
How many parts did I manage? How many resources did I manage? How many hotels do I have? You could do more and more if you had more people, more departments, more places to process. How am I doing with my inventory? Do I have enough? Do I have enough hotels for this day, for this location? And so you could get more people, more paper, more file cabinets, and scale and scale your resources by building out your department, as long as the inner office mail could take from inboxes to outbox. How do I scale the work of a fiefdom in a computer world? Well, collaborations can scale across many nodes. Remember, a collaboration is messages written by this collaborator and messages written by that collaborator that are related to each other. And you simply got to get those messages from one to another. Each side has a replica of the messages. So collaboration replicas live with their collaborator. Collaborators write and read messages on their collaboration, and each one has a replica. The messages are, messages are organized by their writer, so you can just have that information flow without any confusion, and the replicas get more messages over time as knowledge comes to them. Collaborators can be moved. Because they have the replica of all their collaborations, if you wrap their local internal state and you pick it up and you move it, then you can move it somewhere else as long as the messages get routed. Activities can be moved. Take their collaborations and replicas too. Resources can be moved. Remember, resources are surrounded by activities to describe ongoing things that are in, in, in flight that are still being worked on. So if you are managing the inventory of a particular part, you have activities surrounding that part that talk about the commitments to ship the part, and deliveries from the outsiders that are delivering your stuff, your suppliers. And so all of that wraps into a ball, which is not that big because it's just one of many, many, many resources you're managing. So let's talk about a bubble. Now, a bubble is bounded state. It's isolated from the outside except for collaborations, and it can have an internal data, and it lives at exactly one location, at least one location at a time has a unique identifier that's independent of the location, but it's living at one place at a time. Collaborations can be shared across bubbles because each collaboration consists of multiple replicas, multiple copies of the messages that are being sent. You can keep that inside the bubble and then you can talk to something outside of the bubble. So here I've got three collaborations going in and out of this bubble and the bubble can add messages to be sent outside and the system will move them outside. Other outsiders of the part, you know, with a collaboration can add their messages. They will arrive to the bubble when they get there. Local collaborators can write locally and then they can read locally. They can lo and so they push things into their replica and they pull things out of their replica. And the replicas are coordinated separately across bubbles. Now, in the Life Beyond Distributed Transactions paper, I called this entities. And that paper didn't talk as deeply about sequences of messages and it didn't have co uh, collaborations. It talked about messages, but entities in that paper are bubbles in this discussion. So we're going to talk about bubbles. I can move bubbles to tolerate scale. So here in this picture, I have six different bubbles in server one and server one's getting full. It's got too much work. And of course, this is going to be thousands and thousands, but six is what I can put in the graphic. And so now it's getting full. Now, how do I move bubbles for scale? Well, first I freeze the bubble. Stop it processing messages or timer pops. It's frozen now. Then I copy its state to its new home. And then I make sure that messages across those collaborations, all of its collaborations know where the new home is. And so as traffic comes, it can get to the new home and from the new home back to its other collaborators. Then I defrost the bubble. So this looks something like this. Now, once it's there, I have a new world where there's less load on each individual server. I maybe stalled each bubble for a second or two as I moved it, but I can continue the work. So collaborations are interesting here. Those collaborations that I now stretched across two servers, they're a sequence of messages organized by the writer. This is writer number one, collaborator number one, and it's first message, th second message, third message. Collaborator number two, first message, second message, third message. And so all of those replicas are the same, except they might be a little behind on hearing from the other collaborators. This is really easy to replicate. 
I don't have any, any anomalies, no funny behavior with replication. So all I got to do is move it and then continue the flow of the messages within the collaboration. So I can do scale agnostic activities and activity data with this model. Now an activity is going to live in exactly one bubble. And it's got collaboration messages that are routed to the activity within the bubble. One transaction, one bubble. Activities process one incoming message at a time. Now collaborators, collaborations, connect two or more collaborators. I can have an emissary outside of my autonomous boundary, and that may or may not be activities, but there's a sequence of messages from that emissary. But inside the fiefdom, the collaborators are always activities. So I can have a scale agnostic activity, which is a collaborator in a bubble. So the person writing the code for this activity, the workflow for it, doesn't care how many concurrent activities there are. It just cares that it's got to manage these three collaborations to do this work. And I've gotten this from this collaborator and that from that collaborator and manage the business flow of a long running piece of work without worrying about how many pieces there are in the system. Bubbles may move to other servers and there may be multiple activities in a single bubble, but when you pick it up and move it, you're moving the bubbles, you're moving the replicas of the collaboration and you're rerouting the messages that need to get sent. I can also have scale agnostic resources, activities and collaborations. So I've got the current state of a resource. What's the worst case minimum, the worst case maximum? When do I expect incoming shipments? When do I expect deliveries to be due? I have lots of stuff describing the state of that single fine grained resource. Remember the resource is fine grained, a single stock keeping unit, a single pool of class of hotel at a particular site for a particular night, many, many resources, but I'm managing the state that has to happen with expected ongoing work. I have an activity that's dealing with one portion of it. It's booking, you know, uh, deliveries to be sent to a customer for this part. I have another one booking deliveries that are sent to a, a different customer and he may can each of them may cancel, each of them may confirm, whatever. I have incoming shipments my, from my suppliers and those suppliers, they may be late, they may deliver as on their commitments. What am I dealing with for my part? How does it all work? All of this flows in and out of that one thing I'm managing with multiple activities. So the resource has its ongoing state machines for the ongoing activities, but they are relatively small. They can fit in one bubble and the one bubble can be operated on at one system at a time and it can be marched forward transactionally. So all of these things as they weave together on the single resource, it's one transactional environment in one bubble. And we can move bubbles, as we've discussed before. So it's a small amount of data for each resource. It's transactionally updated. It's in, there are embedded activities per collaboration. And you get a transaction for each incoming message or timer pop. And then that also may generate outgoing messages, which will then get routed to the other bubble that they're sharing, that the collaboration is shared with. So sometimes scale agnostic recurrent reference data is needed. Activities sometimes read this recurrent reference data, useful for many reasons, including embedded emissaries. Recall that reference data, recurrent reference data, has identity and version. So it might, for example, be Acme and Sons price list, where the version is Tuesday, March 8th of 2022. Now, I might be using this if I'm buying things from Acme and Sons, and I need the price list, and I need to know what it is today. So the ongoing activity is going to know the version of the reference data. And you're not allowed to magically switch it because that could cause bugs, that could cause weird behavior. Now, it's fine if the activity voluntarily updates it. It's running along with Monday and the activity issues a call to the scale agnostic layer saying, is there later price lists for Acme and Sons? And that's just fine. But what you don't want is you don't want it to have a different behavior because you decided to move the bubble. So imagine here, I've got server one, and it has the March 7th price list from Acme and Sons and the March 8th. And server two only has March 7th. And now I'm running an activity that is referencing the newer, the March 8th version of the price list. That's just fine, that works great. 
Now I want to move that activity to server 2 for scale so that I can actually load balance across these servers. But moving a bubble has to be invisible. The recurrent reference data has to be the correct version for what the bubble is using and it must be at the destination before the move. So don't move the bubble to server 2 until the price list for March 8th is on server 1. The way I think about this is the actual scale agnostic API is tracking the reference data, the recurrent reference data that is being used by the bubble and needs to verify before moving the bubble that that data is still available in its new home. So autonomous computing empowers scale. Fiefdoms, emissaries, and collaborations, they can be made to scale and run across more and more servers if there's more and more of them. The data types in an autonomous world can be made to scale. The private data is focused in on bubbles that contain it, and you can manage that in a way that scales. Collaborations can scale. They don't care about scale. Reference data can scale. User data running within a, an emissary, either embedded or outside, that can scale. So working within a fiefdom can be scale agnostic. The pattern allows it. And application developers should not care about scale. Unfortunately, most implementations artificially constrain scale. And it can be a reasonably large investment to rewrite these applications. So I'm not saying this is magic. But I am saying if you pay attention and you work hard, you can make this environment work in a scale agnostic fashion because the pattern empowers it. So let's conclude by examining how autonomous computing empowers scale. What are the takeaways I want to leave with you? Autonomous computing is a pattern for collaborative work across boundaries. It is long running, long distance, bi-directional, and private. We have personal partnerships and yet shared resources. Autonomous computing pattern has pieces. The collaboration is a sequence of related messages. Fiefdom is a boundary of autonomous work. Emissary makes collaboration easier. And data patterns with collaborations, reference data, private data, and single user data. Now, autonomous computing leads to internal implementation patterns. We have activities, which are state machines to manage the sequence of messages coming in collaborations. We have resources which manage fine-grained shared stuff, lots of resources, lots of different things to manage. And collaborations, they connect activities and resources to other collaborators. You use activities to front end the collaborations and activities can surround those resources. The scale agnostic pieces can be relocated for scale. Activities, resources, and their replica of their part of the collaboration are small scale agnostic pieces. And they can be encapsulated in small bubbles that are the transactional boundary and then moved as needed for scale. Consequently, programmers are agnostic to the scale, making their life focused on the business and not on scale. This pattern empowers scale. Now, most implementations introduce artificial barriers. Still, the pattern allows it. Thank you for paying attention to autonomous computing and for your time.